My name is, is Buddy Ratner. I'm a professor of bioengineering and chemical engineering at the University of Washington. What I am going to be talking about today is how we can take these new technologies, these smart ideas that come out from our work, and how we can commercialize them, how we can get them out where they generate value, where they generate jobs, uh, where they uh, return value to the taxpayers that I feel are funding the, the research that I do. Okay, so I've had a sort of a, what I, I call it my slowly evolving philosophy. It's taken a while. But what, why should an academic scientist be involved in, the, in technology? Uh, we, we've had uh, 900 years of academia that, that talked about the academics being in one camp and uh, industry being another camp. Why, why should I, at this era, 900 years later, uh, be involved in commercialization? <clears throat> well, for one thing, my research is funded by the taxpayers, essentially 100%. They might be the taxpayers of the state, it might be uh, uh, people paying federal income tax, and uh, I, I see this as, as the only way I can return value to the taxpayer who funded the research. Um, as a, I, I think I actually have this on, on a slide following up, but if I publish a brilliant paper, uh, it benefits me, might benefit my own research group, but really does nothing for, for the, the people out in the community there who, who are working and paying taxes, but if I come up with a medical development or even a better widget that makes people's lives better, uh, suddenly the research is generating jobs, it is generating products that make people's lives better. So I, I, I really very sincerely feel that entrepreneurship, spinning out the, um, the uh, um, interesting work and often important work that comes from research is very important. Uh, another part is that engineers uh, create uh, what I call real world things. Um, I have a quote at the bottom, uh, it's a definition of engineer, which is the ingenious contriver of the instruments of civilization. It's a very nice quote. And uh, it, it relates to this thing I call the myth of engineering science. Um, at a university, um, our engineering departments are very different from engineering departments through most of history. Uh, the professors have the exact same criteria for promotion, tenure uh, on them as do any other uh, professor at this university, namely publish or perish, uh, develop uh, th this uh, academic career, and it's very different from what an engineer does. Engineers started out as a trade. Um, engineers build, make things, create knowledge into, in, in, into product and things, uh, the instruments of civilization. So we have this dichotomy in what an engineer is, and, and uh, of course, I, I like promotions, raises, things like that. These are nice. So I do my publication. I, I'm actually quite immersed in the uh, academic world, but I, I like to think of the other side, side too. What is an engineer? An engineer goes out and makes things, builds things, and, and this is part of uh, you know, the in, inventiveness and uh, also translating those inventions to products you can hold in your hand. And since I teach engineers, uh, I have to practice what I teach, and that would mean I should be doing some of this entrepreneurship, not just writing papers. Uh, our UWeb program, the NSF program, had a mandate to commercialize. Uh, it was uh, written right into the uh, grant. It was uh, uh, brought in well over $40 million into the university. And what the NSF wanted to see come out of that is commercialized technologies from the uh, Engineering Research Center. So, uh, and. and Finally, I'd like to say that the university professor salaries are pretty good, but I happen to enjoy good wines. I like nice guitars, art, rare books. They all cost money, so this could be another way to uh, maybe someday, and I can't say at the moment, become a, a person of more wealth than I have at the moment. Uh, engineering accomplishments are, in my eye, not real unless they're adapted by industry. They are you know, a nice academic sort of thing, but what an engineer should be doing is making things that, that people see, see value in and, and can bring it out to, uh, to society. So, uh, for example, in my case, I, I cannot manufacture a medical device. I can invent a medical device, but I don't have the, the uh, uh, good laboratory practices, the good manufacturing practices built into my system. It's very expensive to build those systems in place, and I have to depend on companies to actually manufacture, to put something into a human. 
and that is happening now. Uh, and a paper in science by itself cannot save lives. In fact, it could give away IP that means that a product might never go to market and we'd lose it. And uh, this issue of repaying the taxpayers supporting my research. So there's this wonderful quotation from uh, when Prime Minister Gladstone visited the, most, the lab of the most famous scientists of the time, Michael Faraday, 1850, and asked him whether this esoteric substance called electricity would ever have value or practical use. Faraday replied, one day, sir, you will tax it. And uh, I think that's a very important point. It will go to commerce. Uh, it, it, it is important enough that it will become part of commerce. So uh, we had the, uh, the, the nice grant from the NSF, the University of Washington Engineered Biomaterials Grant. And, and just to, to read you one part of, again, sort of the mandate, the uh, um, requirements for this grant is creating a synergy between science, engineering, and industrial practice Engineering research centers provide the intellectual foundation for industry to collaborate with faculty and students on resolving generic, long-range challenges, producing the knowledge base for steady advances in technology and their speedy transition to marketplace. To get a, uh, an engineering research center, you had to address that point. And, and also, a little bit later, I headed a National Academy's uh, roundtable. It was called BIMA, which was the Biomedical Engineering Materials and Applications Roundtable. Roundtables are um, closed-door meetings of uh, government, industry, and academic scientists. Um, and uh, they're think tanks. Uh, nothing is published, and people try and get over uh, difficult issues. And uh, so um, uh, from the BIMA literature, uh, BIMA was an interface between industry, government, and academia on issues critical to the development of improved biomaterials to enhance patient care and maintain US market leadership in medical devices. So again, th these, these are sort of the mandates that I had that, that drove me to think about um, uh, entrepreneurship. These were the forces that stimulated my interest in commercialization and entrepreneurship. And now, <clears throat> let's, let's just talk about some specific experiences. So I, I filed, find that entrepreneurship, uh, I like to think of it as sort of a wild and crazy roller coaster ride. There are huge ups and downs, and, and they really do make your stomach very queasy, um, particularly when you're on the down. And um, it, it's kind of a madness. So I, I like this, this little, little section from um, uh, Lewis Carroll from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and the Mad Hatter says, uh, why is a raven like a writing desk, asked the Mad Hatter. Uh, have you guessed the riddle yet? Uh, the Hatter said, turning to Alice again. No, I give up, Alice replied. What's the answer? I haven't the slightest idea, said the Hatter. Nor have I, said the March Hare. So uh, to bring that into the context of entrepreneurship, it seems like planning and decision making with incomplete data while riding a roller coaster of a shifting economic climate. I haven't the slightest idea what's going on, and yet you have to act and, and um, uh, uh, drive uh, a product to market in that kind of environment. So how, how might we smooth out such a wild ride? Uh, for an example of the wild ride, let me, let me just tell you about one of my companies, uh, Assemblon. Uh, it's the first company I started, and it's kind of an interesting story. If you, if you look at the website today, 2011, in fact, I just pulled this off the site last night, um, we'll find that the site is sort of under construction. Um, it says, um, shh, something wonderful is about to happen. What if we could fuel vehicles with hydrogen the same way we now fuel them with gasoline and diesel? That's the question we're asking on the website. And so let's look at some history there. Uh, the history really goes back to a very seminal scientific paper published in 1983 which had the, the rather tedious title of absorption of bifunctional organic disulfides in gold surfaces. You wouldn't imagine this um, uh, title would be the uh, basis maybe of an entire industry. It's by uh, two Bell Lab scientists, both now in, uh, academic scientists, Ralph Nuzzo and Dave Alara. Um, and it was the first paper on what's called self-assembled monolayers. And it's a way to make uh, absolutely organized, ordered uh, organic matter. Uh, it was, uh, uh, became a, a very interesting technique for rapidly creating things that had a, a high degree of order. We've always had crystals. Everybody knows inorganic crystals. Uh, um, if you look at the sapphire, the crystalline aluminum oxide, very pretty. 
in that aluminum oxide, every atom is in the exact right place, um, exact perfect place, well-defined place. And it made it easy to study things like crystals. Well, this paper by uh, uh, Nuzo and Lara made it easy to study uh, organic matter. Anyway, uh, what Assembline did is said, this type of structure has the potential to develop a whole new technology. And, um, but what we envisioned is that maybe we could uh, add interesting head groups, interesting tools to the surface of this that would do unique things to the world. And these tools might be uh, uh, any one of, of thousands of organic groups that could deliver signals out to the world in a very organized manner. So uh, what was the decision to launch Assemblon? Well, the year is 2000. I had on my uh, payroll two PhD chemists to make these, these molecules that went into the self-assembled uh, monolayers. I was paying uh, the PhD chemists with benefits and overhead. I was paying about 150000 a year for these two, two uh, people. In fact, my wife asked me, well, why don't you just go out and buy those molecules? You have this big expense. And it turned out there were no commercial sources for them. So if I looked at the competition, there were no commercial sources of these molecules. And, and since I had these chemists on staff, I was constantly being asked, hey, give me a sample of this stuff. I want to do some of this too. So it seemed like there was a need out there. Uh, it, it seemed with a field with much potential. It was a rapidly growing field that addressed a number of important technologies. We'll talk about those in a second. And the business molecule was first to start a specialty chemical company, sell molecules, and then develop new head groups, new hammers, if you will, that will do interesting tasks and then uh, license those molecules to others, for example, molecular electronics and things like that. So uh, the rationale for starting Assemblon, it's the function of a national uh, science foundation, engineering research center, to transition technology from bench to bedside. The, um, our industry advisory board unanimously approved, or unanimously, unanimously proposed that you have spin off companies. Uh, I, I asked, we had many uh, uh, multinational billion dollar companies on our advisory board. I said, why don't you license this stuff from us? And they said, start a spin-off company. Uh, if we like the technology, we'll buy the company. And I directed the Engineering Research Center. And I felt as a leader's role, I really had to take the initiative of starting the company. So this is our, our founders group in 2005. Um, uh, and uh, this lady with hands on the shoulders, that's my wife, Cheryl. And uh, Cheryl uh, actually was the first uh, president of, of Assemblon. Uh, Cheryl had a lot of business experience, which I didn't have at the time, and uh, led us in the first days. Um, this is Maxie Bokel. She was a, a postdoc in my lab. Here's uh, Dan Graham. Dan was a PhD student in my lab. Uh, Esmail Naimi was a, a staff scientist in my lab. And, and Pat Quarles uh, had just left a company called Comba Matrix and was available to become CEO of the company. So he moved into that role. 